Welcome to my best 11 podcast. Today we are joined by a central defender who started his career at Rotherham. Then went on to the big time at Sheffield Wednesday. Um, spent a bit of time at Shrewsbury, Leicester, Crewe, Huddersfield, Bristol, Lincoln, Blackpool, the mighty Luton, and then spent a bit of time over in my neck of the woods over in Australia for Northern Spirit, and then finished his career at um, a little bit of Rainworth as well. Today we are joined by Julian Watts. How are you, Julian? Yeah, really good, thanks, mate. Good to be on. Fantastic, fantastic, Marvin. Central defender, your partner in crime for a few years. How's it done, Julian? On? No, listen, it's um, it's going to be great because um, I have to say about um, Watts, he was there for, like I said, a couple of years, but it, it was just so nice to have um, a fellow like defender who would try and do more tricks than myself. And so it was um, a case of, of of us both getting us each out of the shit every now and then when we tried that, that one too many dribbles, shall we say. <laughs> who, was, who, who would you say was, um, who would you say got away with it a bit more? Who else did you um, have to build up with it in the bank? I, don't, I, think it, I think it was Mark. I think if he didn't do 10 Cruyff turns in the penalty box in every single game, he wasn't happy. And I, I, I definitely couldn't do that. I was more of the uh, running out of defence and looking for the old, uh, you know, the old disguised pass. He was definitely the dribbler. Yeah, I'd probably agree with that. I mean, try and do the unexpected. I mean, like when, when, you, when you're supposed to put your foot for it, they think he's going to clear it. I thought, no, I can start an attack here. So if I can just get away with this Cruyff, and then I can maybe put the next ball forward. We could could have a chance of scoring rather than clearing it. Yeah, Andrew. Awesome. That oh, are totally, totally. he, fro- yep. he froze, yeah. isn't he? For there. You know? Oh, we're back. We're back. So yeah. the way the podcast works for those uh, people who haven't listened before is what we do is we go through um, Julian's best eleven players he's ever set foot on a park with, and he can give some honourable mentions as he goes through. He will give um, some clues to the listeners in the tube on the train, or wherever it is you may be, you can have some guesses as you're doing that. So, I will hand straight over to Julian. What formation are you going to play for your best 11? Well, even this got me in knots. I'm thinking, which formation do we go for? But uh, I think probably easily in the end, I'd go for like a 3-5-2. It was a, it was a formation that sort of came quite trendy in the 90s, which is when I played most of my football uh, you know, Liverpool played like that and all of a sudden the back three was cool and, and everyone was at it. But, you know, the, the formation had come from abroad to quite a few foreign clubs doing it. Uh, and I know that I played it at Rotherham, but that, I don't think there was any sort of uh, uh, much more motivation than the fact that they wanted an extra defender on the pitch because we ended up uh, getting relegated that season. But as I came to Sheffield Wednesday, it was used more and more. And then I moved on to Leicester. And when we got promoted straight into the Premier League, we used the back three. Um, not so much at Bristol, but then I went obviously and joined Marvin at Luton. And again, you know, we played better with a black back three. And sometimes it not just it not I would say it suited myself, but it, it suited the personnel of the players that we had at each of those teams. And, and I'm you know, so we had a, a bit of success with it at, at most places that I was. So I decided in the end that probably that was the best way, which unfortunately means um some of the honourable mentions will be um, some really class players, but didn't quite fit into that formation. Excellent. Jeez, not your problem. It's your team. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you might not be saying that in a minute, mate. No, listen, I, listen, listen. I'm telling you now, you played with some top players. I'm no, listen, I've got no qualms whatsoever. No qualms whatsoever. Didn't- not try to do square pegs and round holes. Totally agree. So, we will jump straight in to goalkeeper. The crazy position on the pitch, Julian. So, over to you. Uh, so, the, the keeper that I went for, uh, it was actually, as a keeper, one of the quietest ones uh, I played with. Very unassuming character. Really, really nice lad. You know, wasn't, you know, in the changing rooms that we had at that time. And, you know, Marvel agreed that we were probably... Last of the old school players where we sort of worked hard and probably played a bit too hard as well, which is something you could definitely not get away with these days. And he wasn't one of the guys that got involved in that, but he was a really, really nice kid. Uh, and he got me out of the poop so many times, including um, in a final, which is a little bit of a clue there, where he's pulled one out of the Ooh. top top drawer that uh, I don't even know how he got to it. Uh, and he was just 
an all-round good keeper and and something that happened to him um you know during the time I spent with him which I, I thought was like a, a terrible thing to happen to someone in the career uh, but I, I remember him and, and despite playing with some I mean I played with a couple of internationals and this guy wasn't an international but he'd still be my number one in the sticks Andrew Kevin Pressman I see what I was going for <laughs> no 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 I mean I, never, I mean, the, 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 Go on. You were going for it, there, Mal. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I was, I was leaning a little bit towards him, but I thought, let me throw Andrew underneath the bus first and let him guess that because <laughs> I'm thinking, I'm thinking, no, hold on, because what threw me was he goes this kid, and I thought, hmm, this is going to be someone who like is not a pressman, not a Chris Woods, not a Casey Keller. Um, I'm just trying to think. I mean, I will give an honourable mention while you're, while you're thinking about it, Mark, to uh, Chris Woods in particular, top, top bloke. I know, you know, there were times in his career where a couple of mistakes and he was really vilified for it. I used to love uh, playing in front of him at, at Chef Wednesday. He was a great guy off the pitch, great guy on the pitch, and he was, he was, he was a good keeper. I think, you know, as like I say, unfortunate, a couple of mistakes here and there, especially in the local derby against United. And obviously, it really uh, it, it sort of helped, not held him back, but um, changed changed his career a little bit. And then obviously, we had the up, uprising of Kevin Pressman, who was the young lad coming through, and then they were fighting for the first team place. But uh, one of my favourite keepers to play with, Chris Woods, but it, it's not Chris at this time. Was 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 this player um, with you at Leicester? Yes, he was, pal. I can't think of his bloody name. I mean, I mean Andrew, you should, you're quite good at this in finals. Who played? Well, he's got the, he's got the same initials as the person you first guessed. I don't. I can't. I mean, he's is done he us well already. now. Is he, is, where else did he play? Where else did he play? Uh, he's, he's, he's from the Midlands. Um, I think he would have played at Birmingham at some point. I mean, he had his he had his oh. major time. Go on. Major Go time. On. At, he had his major time at Leicester. If you look at his career. His most uh, career games were with Leicester City, but it abruptly came to an end when we got promoted uh, and we brought in Casey Keller. Same nah, the only other keeper I could think of was, what's his name, um, Peggy Singh. Peggy, Peggy yeah, no, 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 Peggy Affects had, no, he wasn't the first team keeper. That's the only other Leicester keeper I can think of around there. <laughs> I hope he's not go watching on. this now, I'll be gutted. Go on, go on, go on, you've done it. I can't believe that. Huh? Ke Kevin Poole. Kevin Poole. Was he that young? Him. I didn't really think he was that young back then. Kevin Poole. No, I mean, I, I, terminology, northern terminology, you know, with, you know, kids. You know, um, right. So, Poole, he, he wasn't the tallest. We called him the cat. Uh, in the playoff final against uh, uh, Palace, John John the inside out, and absolutely let one rip from 20 yards, and it was just fading into the top bin. And he, how he's got there, uh, I'll never know. And then the unfortunate bits about that were... Towards the end of the game, the gaffer bought uh, Zalko Kalachon, who was six foot seven, thought it was going to penalties with a minute to go. And then we go down the other end and all the Palace players are looking at us substituting the keeper, wouldn't think of what's going on. And we go and score and Claridge puts it, <laughs> he shins it into the top corner. And Poole has just been subbed off and absolutely, you know, mortified that he was, uh, that he was subbed because we thought it was going to penalties. Having said that, uh, Zelko was six seven, and you know, in, in training, he was difficult to beat even at penalties. So uh, it was a real funny tale that for the final. But, but it was only a minute to go, though, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. It was in extra time. We'd, we'd done the ninety minutes, one one. Uh, we got to extra time, uh, and it was literally uh, well, nearly the last kick of the game. I remember the substitute happened. Claridge was out of position because even us as a team, we were looking round, thinking. Oh, what's going on? And I remember myself thinking, you know, poor Paul, he bloody hell, you know, he's just had an amazing game and he's getting subbed for the penalties. Uh, and then we took the free kick and assists weren't a thing in those days, which is just my luck because I nodded it down and Claridge then sort of just arrived in this area from out of nowhere, uh, chinned, in the top, chinned in the top corner, Nigel Martin planted to the spot. Uh, we all go mad. And then I'm thinking, there's five minutes to go here, and I'm absolutely knackered, can't even move, lungs have gone and everything. And we literally kicked off and the ref blew the whistle. It was, like, unbelievable. What, do you think, was that something then he would have spoken to Pooley about, do you think? No, What's no, it? no, no. I, no, it, it, was, it was a shock to everyone. We, we literally, I don't know who was more stunned, the Palace players or us, uh, we, we literally all stood looking, thinking, and 
personally, I, I, I was gutted for Pooley. Absolutely good. He was a great lad. And when I signed for Leicester, we actually played a back four until we got promoted. But he, um, you know, it was a back five. He was part of that. There was Simon Grayson, myself, Walshie, Mickey Whitlow and Pooley and goal. And we were like, we just bonded and, and made such a great unit right from the off. And it was a massive part of the promotion campaign. And then sadly after that, Casey came in and, you know, he didn't get his opportunity in the Premier League. Either. Was that Martin O'Neill, the manager? Yeah, yeah. 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 Tough, Ooh, tough decision, okay. but interesting. Interesting mm. one. So we'll move on to the centre back in your back three. Uh, right, so the, 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 first, the first one played, uh, started off quite low down, had a lot of games low down. And then um, uh, I know he had a lot of interest from Graham Sooners, and at the same time, a lot of interest from the team I was playing for. Uh, and out of nowhere, he came and signed, and he was uh, quickly into his stride, and and ended up uh, becoming a, a, an international. Did he play this one? Play for Oxford as well. Correct. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Go on, Andrew. Am I, giving, am I giving too much away there? I don't know. Go on, Andrew. If that's it. Andrew, Andrew, I don't know if Andrew knows it. Matt Elliott. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Don't see Marvin. Quietly, sitting here quietly, getting the getting the results. Don't worry. Uh, he, he's a great lad. I still speak to him now. I mean, the unfortunate thing for the whole thing was that he actually sort of came in to replace me. I know the gaffer didn't really fancy me. We played a back three, uh, and I sort of carried on playing due, during the league cup run that season because he was cup tied. Uh, when we did play together, we absolutely, you know, loved playing together. But it was the thing with the gaffer that one of us played and one of us didn't. And, and that was it. And if he was injured, I'd play. And sometimes if there were other injuries to Walsh, I'd get in the team next to him. And like I say, we we really bonded quickly, got on great, but we didn't have that many opportunities. But uh, a fantastic lad on and, on and off the pitch. And like I say, you know, coming from Oxford, obviously people saw his potential, his performances. Soonest was desperate to sign him at Southampton and uh, Martin persuaded him to come you know, to Leicester, so it kiboshed me a little bit, but uh, he's a good mate to have still. Uh, good, a good centre-half, I mean, again, similar to yourself, a, a ball-playing centre-half chief and um, mm. good in the air, strong in the tackle, comfortable on the ball, so, I mean, yeah, it, all round. Very, very good in the air, yeah. You spoke about when you won the um, playoff, uh, was that, I take it that was at Wembley. Um, yeah. What was that like as a day, and would you say that's kind of that day was the biggest day in your kind of career as such in terms of the yeah. wild game. Yeah, I mean, by, by a million miles, uh, Andrew, it was. And uh, it was a funny one because I always got nervous before games. You know, whatever game it was, I got nervous. But as soon as I get onto the pitch, you sort of, it turns into adrenaline. It kicks in and I was absolutely fine. I didn't really have bad nerves on a pitch. Um, but that, on that particular day, we were driving up to Wembley Way. You couldn't see a Palace fan anywhere and and Steve Walsh was obviously been there quite a few times been to Wembley with Leicester for a few playoffs and he was making jokes about being nervous and honestly the knots in my stomach were and I'm just sort of nervously giggling just keeping myself and I was the quietest I've probably ever been in my life and it it really was like a, a big big thing and I've got a picture somewhere uh, right maybe behind me and it's um I'm walking out at Wembley and the pure fear on my face is there <laughs> captured in this photo like absolutely sheepish walking out just before the game uh, but again you know the game kicks off and you get on with it and it was uh, turned out to be a really really good day we, we played well I think we we struggled for 15 or 20 minutes and then we got into the game and we, we, we I thought we were the best team on the day by a mile uh, and um, yeah we, uh, we like I say we nicked it in that in that last minute it was a great day and for me I'd just left Sheffield Wednesday I think it was my 12th game for Leicester in the final and you know back in the Premier League so it was like it was just uh, Good news all around for me personally, but the, the run up to Wembley with the lads and the team bonding and you know going out on the lash and what have you and playing the games and on the, on a great run was just like one of the nicest little periods in my life, if you like, in, in football. And, and was it um, something which you knew was like in the week, or does Martin name the team on the day or day before? What, what when do you know that you was actually? definitely going to be playing in the final um for me i mean like and this is and I'll, I'll flip this on the other side as soon as i've said i mean i knew i'd be playing because like i say that the back four and the keeper we were we'd been 
unbelievable. And I'm not saying me individually, I mean, as a group, we, we clicked really well. We played the first game of debut against Sheffield United. It got absolutely slaughtered by United fans. I had an absolute shocker, lost 2-0. Uh, there was like a protest outside the ground and everything. But after that, we went away to Charlton, who were up there, won one nil. Away to Palace on the Saturday, we were up there. Obviously, we played them in the final, won one nil, and we just went on this run, and we were so so difficult to beat. Clary Jude had a problem when he signed for us, came into some you know great form. Neil Lennon, you know, some other signings came in. We had Emil Esky, who was a seventeen-year-old kid at the time. You know, the mix of what we had was, and it just absolutely came together. And that's one of the things I'll always say about Martin, who wasn't my favourite manager, but he brought players in that fitted in to how he wanted to do things and, and how he wanted his teams to play and, you know, the work ethic and the energy and things like that. And that, you know, that's one thing he did. He, he fitted a, a jigsaw uh, together really well. So we, we pretty much knew the team, to be honest with you. But when, uh, did, he, the, when did he name the team though, Chief? Oh, when I named he named it an hour before kickoff because... That was, a, that was it? Yeah, because a year later... We get to the uh, League Cup final. We've been playing a back three. I've been playing in the League Cup. I played in the, I played in every round, played in the semi-final. But we played Middlesbrough in the league and Janino absolutely tore us apart. Uh, and we lost 3-0 at home. And so we came to the final. We had a we had a Swedish defender called Pontus Carmart. And he had this really weird thing that when he was, if you were running at him with the ball, he was looking at your eyes and not the ball. It was like so weird, Marv. And it was a, something that the Swedish squad worked at. And he'd glance at it, but he'd look at your eyes all the time. And he was a great man marker. And this sort of filtered through. And I, and I just sort of had this feeling that they were going to put Pontus in the middle of the park to, simply to Mark Giannino, which means we would go to a back four. Felt I'd be the one to come out and they'd leave Walsh and Spencer Fryer. But uh, it, he named the team and we didn't know until an hour and 10 minutes before kickoff. And that's when he named it. There were two subs. I wasn't on the bench. Uh, and there was Jamie Lawrence, who had also played every round and he was in the same boat as me and in, in typical fashion we marched straight up to the players bar and I think we had six pints of Guinness in an hour before the kickoff <laughs> and then came back came back downstairs put the shades on and sat in misery and watched the game so uh, yeah so that, that was how Martin operated and some players really like that it wasn't for me I, I want to know I'm playing I want someone to put their arm around me and tell me how great I am and that I'm, I'm going to be playing and stuff like that and that, that wasn't Martin's style and like I say some players really, really sort of, you know, responded to that well. I don't know if I could respond. I mean, even being at a final, do you know what I mean? You've got your family, you're trying to sort out your tickets and, and get people there to come and watch you. And it's like, OK, an hour before, I mean, you, you're not playing. Jeez, I mean. Mm. Well, that was the thing. So me and Jamie, at the time when the... Uh, uh, the changing rooms were behind the goal. The players' lounge was literally right on the other side of the of the stadium. We had to walk all the way through the Leicester fans, and they're all questioning, "Why, why are you doing it? Why are you playing?" And all this. So that was a bit, you know, you were upset as it was. We had a few drinks. We came back down, and literally the first that my missus knew that I wasn't playing was that the teams walked out, and then me and Jamie, me and Jamie were a bit late. And as we walked up, the national anthem started, and we literally like stood uh, behind the goal, you know, where the because we were, <laughs> we didn't get around the pitch in time, and we had to stand there and listen to the national anthem. And obviously, my family were upset, and but I, you know, we didn't have that chance to communicate to them that I wasn't playing. So, you know, that was a tough. Like I say, I had my best day of my career the year before, and that was probably you know the toughest one to take a year later. And you know, like you know, Marvel it's football, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Interesting. Right. So we'll move on to the next centre back, next door to Matty Elliott. Uh, yeah, so uh, this guy, I mean, I think it's going to be quite an easy one to guess. Um, another great lad, someone that I gelled with, someone I still speak with now. Um, had a great career, one one clubman, and I think the thing that gives away, I still think he holds the record in English football for the most red cards. <laughs> really? Steve Walsh? Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that, that, that's, a, that's a fact worth checking up, but I mean... I think it's more in his younger days. I mean, he had a few reds when I played with him, but I know, I think uh, there was a guy at Wolves, there was a massive rivalry at Wolves, especially with him and Steve Bullen. Well, she hated each other with a passion. But I know he hit someone and he, he broke his jaw. Uh, you know, obviously that was straight red. I mean, listen, he was a guy you didn't mess with, Walsh. He was one of the hardest lads I've, I've ever met in football. I mean, he, he didn't back down from anything or anyone. And I've seen him come up against some big players, uh, never phased at all. And it was great to play uh, next to, like I say, we, we in the back four when we started, 
we really bonded well together. We became good mates off the pitch. And then we went into a three, still playing next to each other. And, you know, the Premier League, and it's where Leicester had yo-yoed for a few years. And we managed to that year, I think we finished ninth with like a late flurry of games. So, you know, and it was great for Steve. He'd, uh, you know, in his career, had a lot of knee problems, you know, particularly while I was there, but he came through all that. How he carried on playing through these problems, I don't know. You know, I think he, he spent about five years on Volterill, so, uh, but it, it just seemed to get him through games, which is, you know, we've all done something like that, but he um, he was like Lazarus, he just rose to the occasion, and when you think he wouldn't be fit, he, he put himself down, and uh, absolute man-mountain he was, uh, and, and again, still a good mate. So, like, going back, obviously, now, similar to yourself, he's a centre-half, Chief. Now, I mean, mm -hmm. there's no way, I mean, I mean, I haven't heard this story because of, obviously I'm just asking you now. You didn't start out as a centre half with all the tricks you've got in your in your locker. You, <laughs> where did you? Yeah, where did you? Where did you? Where, where did you start? And how did it start? <laughs> what? So centre forward, left wing, right wing. What is it? Come on. Oh, mate, mate. Well, you, you're not a million miles away. So at school, I was a right winger, but I did always have this thing where I was always trying to help the defence out. And then I went on a trial for an under eleven Sunday team, and they had four right wingers, and I wasn't the most confident of kids, and no one had said left wing. So I've gone, uh, yeah, left wing. I'm a left winger. <laughs> Obviously got in the team, but I actually did all right as well. And I didn't really, I didn't really have a left foot to talk about in those days. So uh, I went through with that, and I, and I, I gradually uh, just worked my way backwards. And I ended up playing centre mid. And, and the reason I played centre mid is something that you'll probably not believe, Mar. But I could, I was like a box to box centre mid, tackled head, <laughs> won the ball back, box to box, um, and, and I went all the way through to that. And I was playing in men's football in. Sheffield uh, at 16 years of age, which was one of the best things that ever happened to me. It really toughened me up. I was in a, a team of like 30 year olds and I was 16, really looked after me. They used to pull me out of the car on a Saturday night after the game when I'd had about six or seven pints after the game. But um, a nice story is that the guy who spotted me uh, for Rotherham, John Breckin, um, he, he, he'd seen me the year before and I was six foot three, big wild air like uh, Mad Max. And he thought I was too old to be an apprentice, so he, he'd sort of ignored it. And he saw me a year later and invited me to train with the apprentices because I was at college at the time and play in the Intermediate League, which was a fantastic league. Uh, and as we went on, I went on as a centre mid. And after about seven or eight games, he kept saying to me, what's your centre half? And I'm like, I'm not, John, I'm not, you know, you've got to be joking. I'm not centre half. He kept on about it and on about it. And the lad who was a centre back got injured and he dropped me back there in a game. And after the game, he's went, I'm telling you now, you're a centre back. And I'm like, John, I am not a centre back. You know, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. So they got to the end of the season, didn't know what was happening really. Uh, and he said, Listen, there's a game at Millmore. I want you to come and play in it. He says, But you're coming to play as a centre back and it's important. And I went, Right, OK. I went and played as a centre back and I was invited back the next season as a centre back. Uh, and if it wasn't for him, I guarantee now I would never have been a professional footballer because I definitely wasn't good enough to be a centre mid. Uh, and, and luckily enough now, my friend at the pub across the road has got corporate at Rotherham and we go to the home games and John runs that lounge. So I still see him now, like most weeks. Oh, fantastic. Uh, and it's great, mate. And I always say to him, and it gets me up on the stage and I'll say, this man, you know, is the reason that, you know, I became a footballer because without him, you know, because uh, I didn't really have a clue, but he, uh, he really sort of changed things for me. It, it just went on from there. It, it, it would have killed you if he would have said, look, I didn't think you was a centre-back, but I just wanted to get rid of you. <laughs> 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 are, you are you out there? <laughs> well, even better, even better, Marv, you'll like this one. So I was at Freshville, and just to smooth the taking away, this young player who actually, I came, so I got in the team, I got in the second team as a left-back, and then I got in the first team with all these like older guys, and I was actually doing really, really well in the centre of the park. So just to smooth them over, and it was sort of classed as a transfer fee, I went for 10 mighty multiplexes and some bibs. <laughs> <laughs> I think that was my highest transfer fee as well. <laughs> Brilliant. That's awesome. So next to Stevie Walsh. <laughs> Next, no, next defender, next defender. Oh, next defender, next defender. Uh, this guy, very uh, unassuming guy. Um, decent footballer, but, you know, I needed to direct him a lot because he was a bit of a nuisance. He'd wander up and down the wing sometimes when he should be next to me. Uh, but eventually I reined him in and we, we formed quite a decent partnership, I felt. Go on, Andrew. I think you might be talking about Marvin. <laughs> 
You can't put me in there. What? That's crazy. You know, can I just tell you, Marv? I'll tell you what, because I spoke to you the other night and you said to me, it's not particular, and I'm not saying you're not the best, but it's no, the, I know. the people that you have an affinity with. And what I will say about my career is that, unfortunately for me, I sort of bitted and bobbed. So I went to, I got, I got in the Rotherham first team, but if the captain was fit, I was in and out. And literally, I wasn't even in the first team at Rotherham when I went on trial to Sheffield United, who said no after two weeks. Went on trial to Sheffield Wednesday. So I still wasn't in Rotherham's first team, signed for Sheffield Wednesday. Spent three years in the reserves, you know, and I got in and out. And Trevor didn't really fancy me, which he more or less told me. Uh, got in the team under Pleat, played the first six, and then I was in and out again, playing out of contract for, a, for an entire season. Got to Leicester, had a really good season and a half, and then the same again. So with the Leicester, it was a it was a small period of really good things, you know, signing for them, getting to the playoffs, getting promoted, got on the league cup run. So, you know, I played in the run all the way up, staying up in the Premier League. Some of the times we had off the pitch on the trips and that. So that was a great period. But my next, you know, my next period is that season at Luton. So I came to Luton. If you remember that you'd signed Soji. I mean, that must be one of that's that is a that is a black mark on Lenny's book. That is <laughs> honestly. What's so anyway, but he was he was suspended for three games. Dodgy? Hold on, either what's wrong with Earthy Dodgy? Oh no! Well, I've got I've got a good one about him, Andrew. If you if you think he's all right, right? So um, he was suspended for three games. So they needed someone on loan. I was good mates with Tony Thorpe, who knew Marv, obviously for the Luton connection. Uh, when I was at Bristol with Thorpe, and it was that was a complete disaster uh, again. So I was looking for first team football, and I went across. Uh, and Marv might not remember this, but we were playing the back three, and Marv was going to play in the middle, and I was playing on the right, and I wasn't like very comfy there, if I'm honest with you. Uh, and then Lenny put me in the middle, which meant Marv thought he was going to have like a big cigar on for the season, and, and he just got pushed <laughs> out to the left a little bit. <laughs> And I was really comfy in the middle because I'd played there a lot. And then it just clicked. And at first we had Alan White and then we had the rise and rise of Gary Doherty. You know, yeah. and we just became a fantastic back three. Uh, Soji was back in after the three-game suspension, but uh, couldn't break that three. I mean, it was a season when the club was in an administration. We were not struggling, but we had a very mix of a few old heads, me, you, Tippy. Uh, and yeah. then we had the youngsters, Liam George, you know, Macca, Springy, uh, you know, Stuart Douglas, all that. And for what we did that season was absolutely amazing. And for me on a personal level is I think we played 53 games and I played 51. So appearances wise, that was my best season. I missed one from injury, one from uh, suspension. Uh, we had the 2-2 draw at Fulham, which was amazing. Great day out. Uh, the, you know, some of the wins, we went away to Reading and 1-2-1. Yeah. Uh, Fatiari scoring late on. And that was a great day because they were one of the big teams in the league. And we had some bad days, but I thought we had some really good days. So, personally, for me, that is my best season as a, as a professional. And just for that. And then, obviously, <laughs> I can remember on the pitch, myself and Marv would be taking the mickey out of the striker who would be stood between <laughs> us. <laughs> and we'd be 30 yards apart, like ripping him to shreds but to each other and not even looking at him. And this poor guy, whoever it was, I think once it was Steve Torpy at Scunthorpe, he was like, what is going off here? And we were just in stitches. And that was like game after game after game. The banter was unbelievable. And we, we, we just had a lot of confidence. We had a lot of faith in each other. We looked after each other. And I think, you know, like Marv said, when I came, we were two old heads and we both wanted to play football. You know, I always wanted to play. You always wanted to play. Uh, and I think it was, a, it was a great period for that. You know, and Doza, he could play a bit as well. And we had a footballing team, to be fair. There was no need for yeah, us to do anything did. else but play. You know, the midfield, the whip and all that. So the reason I put you in, Marvin, you know, is that is that it was my best season. And I enjoyed it. And that, you know, you, you were part of that. I mean, I was You're welcome. Back. Yeah. <laughs> 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 you know, and, and, I, and I, must, I must make some mentions. I must make some honourable mentions, mate, because... When I was at Sheffield Wednesday, I was so lucky to play alongside and train with every day Viv Anderson, who was absolutely amazing. And not just that he was a player, he was coming to the end of his career. He spent so much time with me on the training ground. You know, if I did something right, he'd, he'd literally come like he was going to give me a rollicking, but tell me how good it was. And obviously, if I did something wrong, he'd be equally in your face, and but in the right way. And I learned so much from him and another another great guy off the pitch and played with Des Walker there. We didn't really get on, if I'm honest. So uh, 
That was a bit oh. brought up. Des wanted to play in the middle, a bit like you, Marvin. He ended up playing on the left, and he, he wasn't too chuffed about that because he was an England international. Uh, but that's the way the gaffer decided to do it. So, you know, lucky enough that played with a couple of players like that. But the three I've picked are the three that I had the sort of best times with in my career. Ah, it's a very good, very decent team. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. So, what we're going to do is we're going to pause it here and then yep. we're going to go for a short break. And then when we come back from our break, we will hear from the five in midfield and the two strikers up top. Welcome back to the second part of My Best Eleven with Julian Watt. I'm going to hand straight over to Marv for Marv's quick fire 60 seconds. Over to you, Marvin. Okay. Um, Favourite other sport? Golf. Golden goal or penalty shootout? Penalty shootout. Mm. Messi or Ronaldo? Ronaldo. VAR. Thank no you for VAR. listening to my best level VAR, pod. Use better. We are currently accepting <laughs> applications um, for advertisements and sponsorships. You can reach us at live my best live pod or my um, best live pod at gmail.com. Thank you. Luton versus the yellow team, Bristol City, Bristol Rovers, Sheffield Wednesday, Sheffield United. Which one? Yeah, Wednesday United. Massive. <laughs> Bundesliga, La Liga. Or Syria for quality. Uh, Bundesliga. Bundesliga. Best ground you've played at? Um, b- 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 <laughs> Old Trafford. Ooh, not Wembley. Okay. If you wasn't a footballer, what would you have done? <laughs> I was training to be an accountant. Thank God that didn't work out. <laughs> <laughs> well, what would you have done then? <laughs> In the counter, I'd be the most boring man on the planet. <laughs> <laughs> and okay, um, one more, Mar. one more, one more. Um, funniest, funniest player. Oh, there's a lot. Um, not uh, not in a clever way, Robbie Savage. Okay, excellent, <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. So, I'm just going to pick up a couple of those you said. As every person who's been on this podcast has gone for, when we say, when Mark says VAR or no VAR, you say, use better. What do you mean by that? I mean, do you know when it first came in, I, th- I literally thought in my foolishness, I thought it was just going to be like goal line technology. You know, I didn't realise they were going to break it down for absolutely everything. And I think, you know, uh, that's gone a bit too far. And, and and I think in the first season or so, what they really, really did want wrong, which I think they did better in the Bundesliga, is the referee would go, in the Bundesliga, would go straight over to the monitor. And that is the thing, why are we, late, why are we letting someone in Stockley Park make a decision when, if I'm refing the game, I'm refing the game, so I need to make that decision. I don't need someone to make it for me. So if I am in doubt, or if I get, you know, something in my ear, run straight to the monitor, watch it over and over again, uh, and you know, and, and make the decision from that, and then also the slow motions make some tackles look horrendous, and in real time they might not be. I mean, I think you know you could you could put a lot of tackles in super slow mo, and they, they wouldn't look fantastic. But you know that's the nature of football, and I don't want to take that away because I think I think the nature of football how we played it twenty odd years ago is is leaving us slowly, and I think that's quite sad in the fact that you know you know firm tackles and things like that they were always part of the game and. It's, you know, players diving now, which drives me absolute crackers. I even, and then when defenders started diving, that really sent me apoplectic. I was like, you know, what, what is going off here? Because if, if anyone ever hit me, I'd do anything I could to show him I wasn't hurt. I might, you know, my leg, I'd, I'd walk normally, even if it was agony. And you actually show people that you weren't hurt and that you're going to put them over the touchline in a fair manner. But now, you know, people are flicking ears and they're rolling around like they've been shot. So... Yeah, um, yeah, VAR, but it's used too much and the, the stoppages are far too many and for far too long a period. It really, really disrupts the game and it becomes a bit like, in no disrespect, but American football. 
That's a really good point. I mean, of all the ones who, who've explained that, I think you, you've come up with a really great point there about the referee who's refereeing the game mm, to yeah. go to the monitor, have a look, because what is he? He's, he's in the moment, he's seen something, um, and now he can go, yes, PK or no PK or whatever. Yeah, I think that's yeah. a great idea. He, he can actually say, he can actually say, oh, I've got that right. I think I've got that right. So, yeah, you know, anything that he's in doubt of. But I don't get why a ref's there that he's, you know, the, the, the replay's 50 metres away and someone in a building, you know, miles and miles away makes a decision. It, it doesn't make any sense. So, And it would speed it up as well. And also, these people technically might be great, but as far as I'm aware, they're non-footballers. They should have footballers yeah. sat in the studio because they know, you know, the simulation and, the, you know, they're aware of things like that more often. So, yeah, so... Now that you brought it in, I don't think you can take it out. And there are some, you know, some important bits to it and some right decisions made. But I think we just need to think about how we're using it a lot better and a lot smarter than we are. Oh, definitely, definitely. So we'll move to your five. Where do you want to start? Wing back or in the middle? Where do you want to go? I'll, I'll go. For, I'll go for the middle. Um, so and it, it's a, yeah, it's a, it's a bit of a funny uh, three this, but. Um, so the, the first one uh, was a fantastic player, great to play with. Uh, he used to call me every name under the sun on a Saturday afternoon and always apologised to me first thing on, on Monday morning. He was a bit of a perfectionist. Uh, he was a great footballer, passer, who could drop a ball on a sixpence from, you know, 40 to 50 yards away. Um, yeah, uh, great lad on and off the pitch as well. Go on, Andrew. That, oh, I, can't, I can't guess off that. There's so many players. <laughs> okay, then I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna throw I'm gonna throw a guess. I think we've ever I'm had. Gonna, go on, I'm gonna throw a guess in. I mean, yeah, you're right. There's so many players it could be, but I'm gonna throw a guess in. I'm gonna say um, Neil Lennon. Think Mark. Who? Neil Lennon. No, no, he'd be one of my honourable mentions. Lenny was like fantastic, hardworking. Broke play up, uh, and, and he's not a real mention. And you know, he, he was one that yeah. I really, really thought about. If I, I if I played at Wednesday and at Leicester with two different people, one of them I'll give an honourable mention to, and one of them it is, and they were both absolute footballers above and beyond anything else. I was gonna, I was, I was gonna say, I should have realised when you said he apologised on the money. Lennon, Lennon wouldn't apologise. <laughs> <laughs> Let me want to apologise. So I should have realised that. Let's go for. Um, it was an international. John Sheridan, then. Yes, that's him. Yeah, yeah. He was a great lad. Such a when he said one of the. I mean, if I'd have thought of him as funny lads going football, him and Chris Waddle are like absolute double act. Um, and he was a fantastic player, but very demanding on the pitch. But he always sort of had that where he could have a think about it afterwards and it'd be a literally a regular thing on a Monday morning yeah what's he sorry about Saturday pal you know <laughs> it was like, yeah, I went a bit too far then but it, it was just how he demanded it on the pitch but it, it brought the better out of you and the fact that he could play made you want to play as well so you know and that and in that uh, so felt really lucky to play with him he was a super player and the honourable mention from Leicester would then go to Gary Parker yeah, who wow. was a yeah, quite similar because Parks was just a baller. He could, he again, yeah. the pass, the little disguises, the tricks on the ball. You could give it him surrounded by players. He'd probably come out of it. And another absolutely hilarious, hilarious yeah. lad. But so, yeah, I definitely go. But Chez was like, amazing. Uh, scored the great goal at, at Wembley in 91 against Man United uh, when they won the cup final. Uh, cracking player and a uh, very funny, funny lad uh, off the pitch. And boy, could he drink as well for a short fella. <laughs> <laughs> okay, who's alongside him then? Mm, um, right. So, mm. uh, first one alongside him, uh, when I signed for a club, this guy signed on the very same day on loan and no one had ever heard of him. I don't know how long he was there, but I'm going to chuck in Muzzy, is it? Bang on, Andrew. Well done, Andrew. <laughs> well done, Andrew. Welcome to the game. <laughs> <laughs> that, is that 4 1? And <laughs> uh, so this guy, I mean, what a career he's had. He, and he, and when I said no one's ever heard of him, probably a bit disrespectful. That he came through the ranks at Chelsea as a junior, but never really, you know, got to those heights. Uh, and I remember it was funny, and you know, David Pleat, you know, better than I do, Mark. But he kept telling me all season that Leicester had been to watch me, and he, and he was telling Martin that I was this, and I could do this and do that. And it was really weird the way that he went on about it. 
And on deadline day, he said, Martin's on the phone and I had arranged them with Martin uh, to go down to Leicester to have a chat with him and, you know, uh, and talk about, you know, possible signings. I was out of contract at the time. Uh, and Pleaty, after I put the phone down, still said, did I want to stay? And it was like, oh my God, you're doing my head in because we'd been talking about contracts for about six months and, you know, he wasn't going to give me anything decent. So uh, I went down and spoke to Martin and obviously all that got sorted out and I signed down there. But then the other thing in the evening paper, the Leicester Mercury, was this, like, Muzzy, is it? And literally, I'd never heard of him. I hadn't a clue who he was. Uh, he turned up, you know, the next day. Uh, I don't know if he came training the next day, actually. I trained Thursday, Friday, um, and we played the Saturday again. It was that terrible game against um, Sheffield United. But he came on, and he was one of the bright spots of the team. The pitch was terrible at the time, really bone hard and dry. And in a really, on a really bad day, he really shone out and he played every game after that. He was straight into the team. And then obviously from that, he graced the Premier League, got to, you know, Turkish International. I think he had 12 games, went to a World Cup. Uh, and another, I mean, it's funny that I say about all these lads, they were all great lads, but it was the different era of, we socialised a lot together. I know we did at Luton, we did at Leicester, we did at Sheffield Wednesday. You know, it was a bit different then to how it is now. Uh, but cracking lad, and what a what a player he was in his time. I think yeah. I've, I've mentioned <clears throat> mentioned it um, before. Um, I can't remember who else was was on here, but with all the social media, not, and as I'm not, and this is not saying that we did things bad. Do you know what I mean? In the day, but like mm. you're right, the socialising what we did back in the day was like you couldn't do it nowadays because no, they, no, you couldn't, the, mate, no, the no. cameras yeah. and stuff and everything here. Everyone be thinking, well, look at those, look at look what they're doing now, look. It was just crazy. Yeah. And I think physically as well, like, I mean, you know, the fitness now and the levels and the amount of training they do, you know, we couldn't put that much alcohol in our bodies and train like, train like they do now. And I mean, you know, it was just, you know, people asked me about it and I said, I think it was part and parcel of the game then. We did it. We And at Leicester, I've always said this to everybody, it's a massive thing at Leicester that on that run into the cup, to the playoffs, we, we would play midweek or Saturday, whenever, but midweeks we used to come back on the bus, Oasis belting out that was massive at the time, and we'd be straight out in Leicester, straight into a nightclub, all of us, you know, on the beers, we'd go home in the early hours in the morning, but the, the way that that brought us together as a crew, as a group of players was absolutely frightening, and, it, and it's like when you're on a pitch and you're with your mate, you want to help your mate out more than you do a stranger, if you know what I mean. So when your mates are, and we really just worked hard, never left anyone you know, in trouble. We went back to each other up all the way. And I think that was a massive thing of, you know, the uh, getting up and then staying up and, and doing so well in the fact of that. We used to call ourselves the best pub team in the Premier League because even in the Premier League, we still went out, you know. if Sometimes a gaffer might give us two or three days off. We'd be straight out for a couple of days on a, on a you know, a bit of a two-day bender. But then we'd come back in, it'd run you into the floor and we'd then start looking at the game for the weekend. And, you know, it worked for us then. It's impossible that it would work now at that level, but that, that's just how those times were. Yeah. Can I just ask, you've mentioned that uh, Alki Muzzy is it signed at the same time as you did um, for Leicester. But you'd later on mentioned that you don't think Martin O'Neill fancied it. How did, how, as a, as a non-footballing person, how did that actually happen? How did he sign you, but yet you don't know uh, or you don't think you have to do? That kind of doesn't make no, logic. No, 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 at the time, I mean, I was out of contracts at Wednesday um, and I wasn't, Trevor Francis had basically offered me a contract to play in the reserves and be back up for the first team. And I said, no, I need to go and play football. David Pleat came in and I played all the pre-season games and then the first six games of the season did well went in for talks and he offered me exactly the same contract. And I just didn't understand that. And I wasn't wanting the world and I didn't think I was an established first team player, but to offer me something where someone said, you're a reserve team player, this is what you're going to get to be back up basically. And then to offer that same thing when I was actually, I was having these talks when I was in the first team. So it, it baffled me a little bit that, and that, that, you know, really angered me. And I went on and like I say, kept mentioning Martin and, you know, I don't know what their budget was at the time. I think it went to tribunal and they paid about 220 for me and then I think something like that. Um, but, you know, I, I was doing well. I was doing all right in Wednesday's first team when I got my chances, you know, I had decent games, played in the reserves, you know, I had decent games. The reserve team or the reserve league at the time was a really strong league up north. It was a fantastic league. Um, so, you know, and I went in and, and in, in all fairness, I mean, this is Martin. When I go in to sign talks, he's like, what do you think your strengths are? And I went, I think I'm quite tall for, you know, for a tall guy. And he went, oh, I don't think you're quick. And I was like, 
All right, okay. <laughs> now, this is when I'm talking to Ryan and I'm just about to sign it. And that put doubts in my mind straight away. I'm thinking, well, I'll be starting on Saturday and I've just signed for them, you know. And, and that was the thing that I didn't like about Martin. It was those, you know, he put the doubts in your head. And like I say, Ian Marshall and Robbie Savage loved the way that he was and they responded to it and it, it didn't help me. So, you know, in that, so the, the, the trade time was, and if I'd have probably been a bit more feisty in, in that time, I would have done something about it. But... I signed an okay contract and part of it was that I would sign a new contract if we got a promotion. It was written into the contract. So we get promotion. I go and see the gaffer in the summer. I uh, said, you know, it was part of my contract, blah, blah, blah. And he went, no, I'm not giving you a new contract. And I was like, yeah, no. he goes, well, I'm just not giving you one. Didn't have an agent at the time, which, you know, at the time agents were, you know, some were great, some weren't, weren't so great, but I wish I'd had one then. Uh, so I didn't get a contract. So then acquired an agent and, and he actually negotiated like a blue, like a big payment if I played so many games that season. But from that thing there, I know he doesn't fancy me in the Premier League. You know, straight away that's telling me that. And and again, a Robbie Savage might have thought, right, well, I'll show him. But for me, it just sort of like drained my confidence a little bit. So it had an opposite effect to, you know, to what I would have liked. But, you know, we're all different personalities, you know, different makeups. And um, so right from that moment, I knew. And then, you know, played some games. And then obviously, uh, I think, Partway through the season, you know, I'd come in to replace when I signed Jimmy Willis and Colin Hill and Colin was coming to the end of his career and we played Middlesbrough away and I, I sort of tweaked my hammy. So he brought me off, put Colin Hill on and then I couldn't get back in the team for Colin Hill. And I was like, you know, I came to replace that guy, you know, 18 months ago and now you, you've put him in front of me. So, and you know, the, the hard thing for me is that it made me doubt myself. And one of the better things I had about my game is that I read the game well, but when you read the game well and you think you know what's going to happen, but you don't have the courage to, you know, to, you know, act out your convictions, it takes away a big part of your game. And I, and I found that a lot. And, you know, it was, uh, it, it became a struggle, you know, mentally became a struggle, uh, you know, getting in the team. So I found you know, the rest of the time at Leicester quite difficult. And how, how old was you then, then, when that contract, is written in your contract, it goes, no, mm. I'm not, not honouring. Mm. How old was you there then, Chief? Uh, 96, 25. I would have been um, 25 years old, mate. 25. Right, I'd, not... I'd, literally, I'd literally just signed in the March, and these talks were obviously, playoffs were end of June, we all went on holiday, came back. It's probably end of June, early July, just before pre-season. Went in his office, oh, you know. You don't think, say, oh, look, I've got it here written in my contract. I'm going to take you to try. Or, no, or, no, or no, no, exactly, Marv. You, you know me. I mean, um, you know, I was always a decent bloke and I was like, all right, OK. You know, and I just accepted it. Like I say, I wish at the time I would have had an agent because it had been, you know, and then I would have someone to bounce off. But I didn't really have anyone, you know, to bounce off. PFA, you always say they're there, but they're always quite busy. You know, it's not, it's not that easy. So... Uh, like I say, then I did get an agent and then he went in and, and to be fair, he said the same, but he said, I've got you this. And it was, you know, a decent chunk of money to play X amount of games, which I ended up playing. So, you know, I got that, you know, as a, as a bonus. But the fact that the contract wasn't going to get any longer, you know, I'd signed for two and a bit years. So, you know, and I, I sort of knew then that the, that was going to be the end of the time at Leicester. And I look back now and I think it was a bit more of a, you know, if I'd have stuck up for myself a bit more, which I didn't do in those days, I'd have gone in and slapped a transfer request in. You know, when I said, you know, I've come here, I've done it ever so well, I've got promoted, I've set up the winner, by the way. Do you know what? I'll go and do it, I'll go and try somewhere else. Because right at that point, that was probably right there and then where my where I was at my highest in my career yeah. as, as probably as a worth, you know, for what that period of time that I'd done. So, you know, you know, that's when maybe I should have acted. But, you know, we're all individuals and we didn't and I didn't. And, you know, like I say, it's always easy to look back in hindsight, but, you know, mm. I just took it on the chin and, and carried on. And, you know, but from then on to answer Andrew's question is, it's at that point, you know, I know that two years is the longest I'm going to be at Leicester and, and there's not going to be any more contracts. Wow. <laughs> I just can't believe that happened. I, I yeah, won that. Yeah, it's, won it's, it, it's, it, it's not that, it's not that I condone violence, but you because those things carry on going a lot. I'm surprised that there's not a lot more managers get hurt when they say <laughs> they're going to do something, right? Mm. And then they go back on it. I really find that amazing that he mm. could do that. Incredible, incredible. We will move on with, rather than ponder on some negatives, we'll move on to some positives and the players who you have played with. Who's next to Muzzy? Um, who else is finishing off your three? 
Well, it's a bit of a, a bit of a conundrum this one because it's not exactly his position. So what I would say to, for a clue is got it, got it, got it, got it. Go on. Go on. Carry on. Uh, is it, you could call him as an attacking midfielder, but it wasn't the exact position he played in. But whatever formation we played or I put out tonight, he had to be in it. He was like the biggest legend I've ever played with. Great, great guy. Again, someone I still see every now and then and we'll have a laugh and a beer. Uh, and I always think the time that I saw him play, uh, not everyone would agree with me, but I didn't really see him before that. But I thought they were the absolute, you know, sparkling years of his career. He was, it was absolutely off the clock. And Marv, you would have sat next to me and we would have just been wetting ourselves laughing at what he was doing on a football pitch. Enjoyment. Cricky Waddle? Yeah, yeah, obviously. Yeah. Um, he, he had his finest years there for me. And when, when he was in the team, we would play the 4 4 2 and he played on the right. And obviously, everyone knew he had a left foot and no right foot. But every now and then, he'd just go down the line and just put an equally decent cross in with the right foot. And I remember on a particular day that, uh, you know, Julian Dixon had obviously the reputation that he did. Uh, and Wads just had him in absolute knots, sat him down on his backside. They were doubling up on him. The crowd were laughing. They were cheering. And it was just nonstop. Every time we got the ball, we just ran. And Wads never really got back in defence, but he had, he had um, uh, Roland Nielsen behind him. It was Rolls-Royce. He didn't really have to defend with Roly there. So, uh, and he just stayed there. We ran the ball down his throat and he just went and did his thing. And, you know, you could see Julian Dix making lunge after lunge. The, the lunges were getting higher and it was just made it all the more laughable. Uh, and there was even the time some good footage where he actually nutmegged Ryan Giggs, who'd gone to closing down in a in another game. And he, he just had for me absolute golden years at Sheffield Wednesday. It was such, you know, good fun to watch, good fun out. Another one, I mean, again, we all went out and had a beer. And I used to actually room with him quite a bit. And he used to have about a thousand hilarious Paul Gascoigne jokes or stories about what Gaz went up to. We'd, I'd spend hours in my room at night, like just laughing and laughing at some of the most ridiculous you know, unrepeatable stories that you've ever heard about Gaza. So, uh, yeah, he was, uh, he was a great guy. He, he actually did really well for me. We, um, Steve Walsh had a testimonial while I was there and they were like saying, you know, can you get some players down? I'm like, well, you know, like anyone. So I ring Wads and said, oh, you know, would you, would you come down? And he was like, yeah, I'll come down. And um, I <clears throat> spoke to like the guy who was organising Walsh's testimonial. Uh, and then, they get another phone call from Chris and it was when Gazza was at, Chef, uh, at Rangers and he wasn't playing, he was out of the team or there was some shenanigans that had gone off and he, was, he wasn't playing and he sort of said to the guy, is it alright if Gazza comes and plays? And the guy's like, yeah, that's great, yeah, no worries at all. And then we get there that night and Gazza turns up and at the time he was massive mates with uh, Chris Evans um, and it was like, uh, Chris Evans is here, can, can he come and play for He said, he's absolutely no clue how to play football whatsoever. Can he come and put a shirt on and come and just get on the pitch for like five or ten minutes? And we're just like, yeah, of course you can. Yeah, no worries at all, mate. <laughs> so, <laughs> and, uh, before we kicked off, Gazza had uh, upset all the first team coaches. He'd gone into the coaches room, nicked a bottle of whiskey and he'd got like a big plastic cup tumbler full of whiskey like that. And this was before the game. And he was absolutely the main entertainment throughout the game. He was hilarious. I mean, entertained the crowd, absolutely made the night. Uh, Chris Evans came on with 10 minutes to go. You know, there were some other legends there. I think Peter Beers had played and players like that. And then we went out in town and um, Chris, like, literally, this nightclub came to a standstill. They gave him the mic and he did a bit of TFI Friday, stood up on some stairs in this, you know, and the whole nightclub was just like, you know, it's just like this surreal moment. And we were all like, oh my God. So uh, it was like an amazing night, amazing night for Walsh because he deserved a great testimonial. So, uh, but yeah, no, that all originated from, from Chris Waddle, who's, uh, like I say, such a great guy. He's, he's been in the, um, quite a few other people's teams and he and he's and everyone said about him how nice a guy he was he i think it was um andy kwamia and he, he used to pick andy kwamia up um he used to get drive him, didn't he? drive him yeah, yeah he used to drive him and that and he used to say like he was just like i'm real because uh, he was at bradford yeah bradford with yeah him. Brad yeah so. yeah and the, 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 the thing with chris is i mean i think i think he's still playing now but I ended up, we used to play on a, some Sundays in, in Sheffield where they'd have a charity game and it was, you know, some people would pay money for a charity to play against Chris's team. And like, I'd ask myself, I mean, I know Chris Wilder's played, Gaz has played a few times and 
John Sheridan's always there and, and players like players like that. And the worst thing about him, he's so competitive still. And he would be moaning like anything through the game. What's he? Get up, get up, get that line up. And you're like, mate, it's for charity. Just chill out. <laughs> but he was, and right through. And like I say, if he's, I don't know, he'll still be playing five sides somewhere now, but super competitive, even played, you know, through his, you know, non league and just these charity games. He just, he absolutely lives and breathes football and he, he really knows his stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Why do you think he's never really got into management? Fully in terms yeah, of man- he made, a name, made a name for himself, I mean. Yeah, I mean, he, he managed Burnley briefly, uh, and he, I think it just didn't work out. And sometimes when it doesn't work out, whether that's the thing where, you know, other clubs look at him and think, oh, that didn't go well, you know, let's, you know, leave that alone. Or whether Chris himself felt, you know, many, maybe management wasn't for him. I know uh, when I think Adrian Heath was his assistant at Burnley, and he rang me because that was another club that had come in for me. And I would have loved to. Uh, have gone to play for Chris at Burnley and you know I, we got on ever so well uh, you know when I was at my time at Wednesday uh, and it, you know it would have been a decent I thought it would have been a decent move to me but I think at the time I don't think they could afford fees or things like that so that never happened and then consequently uh, you know I go to Leicester but on the management side I'm I'm not sure on that one Andrew it's not, not something I spoke about but I, I don't think it was a fantastic time for him at Burnley I don't think they did ever so well while I was there yeah fair enough fair enough so we go to wing back or mm. attacking, attacking wingers. I don't know how you're going to do this. Is this going to be the most yeah. popular thing? Yeah, yeah, I mean, there's a few that, you know, I thought about this and it was a difficult, especially on the right-hand side. So there was, I mean, I mentioned Nolan Nielsen early, but he was more of your classic right-back and he was probably the best right-back, you know, I've ever been on a pitch with or, you know, trained with or whatever. He was absolutely amazing. And there was the other guy, the American, uh, John Arks, who, again, fantastic right back, had a great sort of career at Wednesday. Uh, this guy came in, we used to call him Scooby. I haven't got a clue why. Uh, I can't even think of any relation to his name. I would call him Scooby, but took his time to settle in. He was very quiet at first. And, and then after that, he really sort of got in with the, the mood of the rest of the lads. And he, he had some very like, unassuming, quiet banter that was absolutely hilarious. And But what a, what a fantastic... Uh, footballer you know he was and that wing back position was made for him which is why I sort of got over him over a couple of other players that uh, you know that I've mentioned which which side are we uh, going right or left right we're going on the right mate right. I'd have to guess at Sheffield Wednesday was it yeah and I think it'd be pretty easy for you to guess now Andrew I think it, I think I'm guessing it's his, your favourite player Andrew I'm just guessing I used to like him. What? Dan, Petr- Dan Petrescu. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 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 He was in um, Pleaty's team, wasn't he? He was in Pleaty's team. Yeah, yeah, yeah he was, yeah. 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 Pleaty yeah. picked him. Pleaty picked him on his 11 when he was on here. Yeah. I mean, when, when, he, uh, when he came, uh, like I say, he was really quiet. He's Romanian. He's come, to, you know, he's come over here to play. And I, I, this is one of those stories that I'm sure is true. And I remember it... I remember it being told to me at the time, whether it's urban legend or not, I know, but apparently one morning when he's not been there long and he's not really like tuned into the banter, he's, he's driving his car to the ground and he pulls up at some traffic lights uh, and David Hurst pulls up behind him, goes right up to his bumper and pushes him out in front of the traffic. <laughs> <laughs> no, really? And he's like, what, what is going on here? <laughs> And again, I cannot confirm that story. It's a story that was banded around at the time. And I'm sure I've heard it in the changing rooms and we were laughing. And we're like, no, you can't do that. And he just nudged him out a couple of yards in front of the track. Can you imagine he was the like, panic. new to the country. And yeah. <laughs> he was new to the country, you know. I'm sure, I'm sure their, their ethics, the way they trained and looked after themselves in Romania was far better than or where he was playing before was far better than the way we did. So uh, it was a bit of a shock to his system culture, but... When he settled down, he, he was fantastic. Really good to play with as well. Really intelligent footballer. Very good on the ball. And then, you know, obviously uh, he left Wednesday and uh, went on to have a fantastic career at Chelsea. Yeah, fantastic player. Up and down that, up and down that right hand side. So, are we going to get any better than Dan Prescu? Who I do like as a player. I always thought he was a great player, as Marv mentioned. Left hand side. Uh, again, it's, you know, reflecting on, on times that I had and, and where I was at the time. So uh, this lad, um, he, uh, 
he, he had a fantastic career, great left foot, uh, super player, super attitude. Uh, and I, I mean, the clue I give you, which probably give it away, is that he made uh, his debut for the club the same the same day that I did. Oh, that's me out then. Um, oh, the same day you did. I'm going to throw it in there. Guppy. No, no. mate. No, he was... Uh, and again, honourable mention to Steve Guppy, cracking lad. I mean, he came to Leicester and he was a bit of a nervous kid at the time and he was... It took him a while to settle in, but when he did, I mean, he produced some great uh, great football for uh, uh, for Leicester. But yeah, honourable mention to him, but uh, no, he was not even... Did you, not, did you not play with Stevie Nichol? Did I? Yeah, at Wednesday? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, uh, that, there's another not interesting him. story there. So, come, come, it no, it's not him, but coming back from an away game uh, on the coach, and this definitely wouldn't happen now, and at the back of the coach, there's Steve Nichol, David Hurst, and Reggie Blinker all having a fag. <laughs> <laughs> That's <laughs> <a true story. laughs> oh, dear. So yeah, Steve was great addition to the squad and everything, his experience and what have you, cracky lad as well. But yeah, he was I mean he was absolutely old school, old school uh footballer. What, but yeah, he what, was a funny lad. What what club are you at? In this many oh, same mate, that, just gives it, that just gives it away, mate. Well, okay, okay. I'm gonna away. go Matty Matt Taylor. Correct, yeah. Yeah. I'm 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I think he was 70. I'd just signed when I, you know, I played pre-season, but we played away at Notts County. Uh, you know, like I say, there was all these things about the club surrounding the club and the position it was in financially. Uh, and we made it, you know, like I say, that was a, a sort of example of this side. So I think I would have been about 28, 29. He was 17. I don't know if Liam George played that day. He was a kid. We've got Matthew Spring, Paul McLaren. Then you've got Marv next to me. Then you've got Phil Gray, you know, and right, right away, it was just this. And it, and it balanced quite well in the end. There was a bit of a, a tiny sort of divide in the change rooms, but there would have been because, you know, the, the gap in, yeah. you know, offers to offers. And I think there was people like Macker and Springy were in the middle who, you know, got on with both sort of factions, if you like. But it was all good in the end, you know. And uh, But it was it was such a... Uh, a, f a funny side in that respect, uh, but the fact that we, we came through some, uh, well, it was a bad period for the club and that we, that we came through it, we came through it well, so I think there was a point in the season where we actually thought we were going to do something. We were sort of not a million miles away from that top six, and it was like, you know, can we do it, can we do it? And unfortunately, you know, the, the situation in the season took its toll and we sort of petered away towards the end, unfortunately. But I thought Matty went on, had a great career. Uh, he was a good player, fresh young lad at the time. Great left foot, used to get up and down that wing. I think that was one of my favourite balls. It was the 60-yard uh, toe pump to the left left <laughs> corner of the pitch and hopefully he'd be running onto it if he was quick enough to get on the uh, end of my sledgehammer or club up or whatever it was. But uh, no, so, and again, it goes back to good period of my career, uh, you know, and, and a player that fitted into that. And I did think he was a very, very good player. Yeah, he was. I mean, I just, I, I think I was, the other day I saw it, I was... Going through, um, just flicking through Sky Sports, and they have the um, the goal of the month, like for one month, and he, and his goal was in it where that volley for Portsmouth is like yeah. come onto it and yeah. just, and there was like, um, the, the best goal of the month I've ever seen because there was skulls had a, um, a volley from a corner. There were so yeah. many goals <laughs> in that month, and it was I don't know who won it by the way, but yeah, tails hit. It was a ridiculous volley, wasn't it, from about forty yeah, yards yeah. or something. I don't remember him scoring one against we, when we were unfortunately ended up getting relegated. And I can't remember we were at home to someone and he chipped the keeper from miles out, or it, it was a volley that went over the keeper from quite a way out. But now he was a talented lad, absolutely fantastic left foot, and you know that was just his beginning. And, and it, you know he went on and did well for himself. Fair play. Yeah, excellent. It was a bit harsh now. We went, Luton only got four hundred grand for him, but, but that was that was a tribunal. So mm. yeah, oh, mm. cheap. Yeah, it was. So, strikers, we're now up top with a big money. That's the reason why these boys get paid the most money. I don't know if you'd buy it. I thought I'd, I'd fish if a couple of central defenders would buy it or not. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, 
the first guy, I mean, I, I think you'll, you'll probably get, guess this one quite easy. Having said that, I played with some really, really good strikers at, at, at most clubs and, you know, some are international, some aren't, and what have you. But uh, this guy is, um, I mean, it's a giveaway, but he's the best striker I've ever played with. He was absolutely phenomenal. phenomenal. Uh, but he only really had half a career, unfortunately. But uh, what, a, what a player this guy was. And I tell you what, he would have changed the dynamics of a lot of players uh, if he hadn't have got injured. Yeah, um, David Hurst. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I know I made that one easy, but, he, you know, at the time there was the him or Shearer for England. Um, and, I, I, you know, Alan Shearer for me, I thought Alan Shearer, obviously we all know he's a great player. I thought Alan Shearer was a seven or eight out of ten in every department. Erste, I think he was excessive as that. He was like frightening to, you know, train with him, played with him. I've never seen a striker move so well. He, he was a bit like Vardy does now at Leicester. He was running in behind all the time, which, you know, not a lot of strikers do, but he could also hold it up. His, I mean, his decent right foot, his left foot was an absolute rocket. I mean, big things in the press. He was, you know, Ferguson was desperate to sign him when yeah. they had gold droughts. And I think he always scored a worldie from Man United. It was never closer than 30 yards and he'd, he'd sort of top bin it. But I, I feel like, and then this is no disrespect to, you know, the legend that is Alan Shearer, it would have been a lot different if he didn't get that terrible injury. And it was a really bad tackle, uh, broke his ankle. Uh, and unfortunately, while he was still a good player, still played in the Premier League, he was, he was never the same player that he was before that injury. And it, it was such a shame. And I think he's still down recorded as the hardest shot in football, the one that hit the crossbar. I might be wrong, I'm not sure. But he did have an absolute rocket. And I actually spent a lot of time with him. We were both injured at the same time. And sometimes, you know, you get to know someone really well when day in, day out, when it's hard. It was like literally months. He'd, he'd got his ankle, I'd broken that tarsal. We, we sort of had maybe three months in every day in the gym together, which is hard slog. If, you know, morning, afternoon treatments and all that, got to know him really well in that period. But it's uh, such a shame what happened to him because he, he was like, you know, outrageously good. No, I mean, I, I, I totally agree with you. I mean, he 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 made them. He came onto the scene, and like you said, he, he probably was. He had everything, didn't he? Because he could he could like head. He was quick. Yeah, he could he could shoot. He could score goals, and he and he could hold the ball up. He was his all round game was like this. I mean, just that little bit ahead of probably at the time. Yeah. I mean, Shearer went on to do well, very well. <clears throat> yeah. but he was a little bit ahead of Shearer, in my opinion, regarding yeah. obviously. Quality-wise, all-round game. Yeah, I mean, I think so. And I think the thing, the, the the unfortunate thing here was him. I remember the England game that they played in. It might have been against France, and I think Hurstie played the first half, and Shearer played the second half. And I think you all know. I think you, we we know them all that the first half of the game is probably harder than the second half. Feeling each other out. There's a bit different tempo and all that kind of stuff. And he did he did well, but then Shearer comes on and scores, and he gets all the headlines. And and then it was not long after that he got this injury as well. So. You know, I always, I always felt from that. And then I think that after the injury, that was stopping him running behind and he then became the target man. So he was still mm. a great player, but then the niggles were his there. I mean, I've seen the surgery he had down the back of his Achilles, but his Achilles now sticks out a little bit right down the length of it. And it, it was some, you know, unbelievable surgery that got him back playing, but it, it affected, you know, the all-round game that you've just talked about that he had. So, yeah, it was a, it was a tough one, that. But, you know, he, he still had a great career, you know, despite that. But it's, uh, he was definitely... The best I've played with, and I would say against. It was our guys alongside him. Uh, another difficult one. Like I say there's a, there's a couple who, who you'd think of. Uh, but <laughs> this guy, the scruffiest guy that I've ever played with. Um, funny guy. Never ever ever came out ever. But the odd time that he did, he was just hilarious. And I mean, absolutely value for money on a night out. Um, had a lot of problems um, when I was first sort of playing with him and he found that really frustrating. He had a decent price tag on him at the time, uh, but he came through it. Massive part of the squad, great part of the squad as well and, and you know, um, scored some very, very important goals. Did he play for Cambridge? He did. <laughs> oh. Yeah. <laughs> Another easy one. How did you not know? <laughs> Andrew, Andrew's, Andrew's face, though. Look at Andrew's face. <laughs> Cambridge. Cambridge. Why do you have to go with a curveball cut club? Hold the shot. <laughs> yeah. And he managed that. He must manage the shot, wouldn't he? 
Yeah, managed Weymouth, managed uh, managed Plymouth for a short time, and very unfortunate to have it stripped away from him. Came to Luton as well. Yeah, went for Luton. Andrew now. <laughs> Hey, Clary. Yes. <laughs> You're just teasing us, Andrew. I, I was quite right. calm down when you started reeling all the clubs off. I was kind of, oh, yeah. How is it? 23, 24 clubs? Or yeah, yeah. It's, it's a long, long list. And uh, like when he came to, so Martin, this is the problem that Martin had. So he'd signed Neil Lennon from Crew. He signed Claridge. I can't remember where from. Was it, I don't know if it was, was it Birmingham before us or after? I can't remember. It, was, but it might have been Birmingham, but it was a million pounds. And he had a problem with his thyroids, and it meant that he um, he had he didn't have a lot of feeling in his feet, and it just looked like he had the worst touch of any striker I'd ever played with. You know, the ball was bouncing off him. He, he looks, you know, and he, he was a bit scruffy and irregular. Um, but they, they sort of managed to pinpoint what that was, what that was, give him the right treatment, uh, and he became such an important player. And he's a He's just a player. He never really had pace, but if we were doing fast laps when we were running, he would do the same time every fast lap. So, you know, I'd start off and it might be 52 seconds and you'd have a few minutes rest. 52 seconds, then it might be 54, then it might be 56. He just went 55, 55, 55. And he could run at that one pace constantly. And that's, so towards the end of games, you know, he was like, still, he was like fresh as a daisy. You know, and the striker was thinking, Christ, I I wish this guy had, you know, uh, pack in. But um, it, it was very unorthodox, but very effective. Uh, scored the winner in the playoff final, scored the goal that I think won the... Uh, League Cup final, you know, so scored some big, big goals, very popular with the crowd. And I think what they loved about him is he never stopped running. He never stopped running. He never stopped trying. He made him make a mistake, but he'd be back on it and back on it. And again, honourable mention to uh, Emil Heskey, who when I turned up at Leicester was 17-year-old playing on the left wing. Uh, and obviously as he got a bit older, a bit more physical, even though he was a big lad then actually, but obviously he came in, <clears throat> came and played in as a striker then. Uh, I just felt that Steve... Probably more poignant in my time there. You know, Emil went on, had a great career. And I think while he was never prolif prolific, Emil, even though he had that one really good season at Liverpool, I do know when I've spoke to players or players who've known players who've played with him and say, you know, who's the best striker that you played with? The lot will say him, you know, the Fowlers, Michael Owen, players like that who played alongside him said he was the best striker to play alongside because he just provided, you know, so much for them, even though maybe he didn't have the goals that you might, you know, you know, like you might want a striker to score. He'd still chip in with, like, probably get to double figures, but it was what he created uh, for the other players. And he was, uh, he was like a real young lad, green behind the ears when I, you know, when I first signed up, but uh, what a player he became on to be. But, you know, just for me, for Claridge, he, uh, he was probably more poignant at the time that I was there. Yeah. I was mean, yours a joker? Was yours a joker? Because he is a joker now. <laughs> Who's that? Claridge. Oh, yeah. He, he, but that was the thing you could never get. He, he literally, so he, he turned up and he turned up and he had a, he had a Merlin 190E, a, like a white one. And he'd literally, we trained at half 10. So we'd get there about anywhere between quarter past nine, half past nine, have a cup of tea, get changed, get your kit on, chatting away in the lounge bit. And then we'd walk out on the training ground. As we're walking out at 29 minutes past 10, this Merc had come screeching around the car park. He'd pull up by the training pitch, get out. There'd just be so much crap in the back of his yeah. car. And I'm talking clothes, bibs, trainers. And he'd have these crappy, horrible jogging bottoms on and his training top that he'd probably worn all week and his boots on and just run onto the training pitch and train. And then he'd get back in his car and go when we'd finished. And he was straight in the bookies in his kit like that. And he'd like be betting all afternoon. And it was like, it was unbelievable. And that was him every single day. Um, uh, so he would do that, he was just funny in that. And, and like I say, I can remember about two occasions where he actually did come on a night out with us. And he was hilarious. And he just went berserk. You know, it was like he'd never been introduced to alcohol before. And, you know, you give him a few beers and he was absolutely off the bouncing off the walls everywhere he went. But you just you just couldn't get him out. I mean, he lived quite a way away. So, you know, there was that, you know, to factor in. But, uh, yeah, cracking, cracking lad. Very funny, very intelligent. And like I say, um, I went to watch a game at Molyneux where uh, Wolves played Portsmouth and he was managing Port Portsmouth and he looked like he'd got them playing well and he was absolutely buzzing. And then uh, sadly, it was like a thing of, you know, a bigger name coming in and the chairman at the time, can't remember who it was, decided that, you know, Steve wasn't the man and it was such a shame because you could see 
the passion he'd got and the enthusiasm for Portsmouth Football Club. I was going to say, he's probably one of the ones who I was the least expected not to work out at Luton when he came. Because when he came, obviously, I mean, he wasn't as, I mean, he went on to great and massive things. I mean, playing for Leicester and stuff and scoring in the playoff finals and cup finals. But we knew of him from what he could do. And it's like, oh my God, he loves the ball into his feet. He can twist and turn. He'd be a great link play. But for whatever reason, it just didn't seem to work out for him. Um, I mean, and he was only there for a short time. I mean, even though he was there in that short time, I mean, mm. I got on well with him. You know what I mean? Clarabel mm. was, was his nickname. And he was funny, like you said, and he, exactly what you just said there. He, he used to just turn up at practice, screech, his, uh, get out, go go and train, and then jump back in. And, 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 I, and I, he didn't like, I don't know if it was obviously because he, he loves to gamble, but he had loads and loads of money just underneath his seats. Just like, I mean, thousands, thousands of like, just cash there, just sitting underneath his seat. <laughs> it was just crazy. Absolute crazy. Yeah, yeah. Good, good lad, isn't it? He was, he was a good player for us. So, you know, maybe he was coming to the wrong side of the career, Marvin, the standard where mm. he was might have been a bit too much for him. But like I say, he struggled with us. And he did have that. The ball used to come in and he'd, he'd twist one way, twist the other way. To, and, and he could do that all game. And, you know, at, at Leicester, you know, it, it worked out for him. And uh, he, like I say, very unorthodox, but it, it just clicked for him there. So, uh, uh, and but yeah, such a, such a funny lad. Okay, Fantastic. so... Marvin. Who's who's going to manage this team? Which which of these managers? Well, we know it's not going to be Martin O'Neill. <laughs> <laughs> as ever, as as ever, Marv, this comes with a story, and you're, you're going to love this. Go so uh, the manager that I would have to manage this team, who was my favourite manager, uh, was Lenny, Lenny Lawrence. So I thought Lenny sort of treated me. And I don't mean this as like a big time player, but as, as you would like to be treated as a footballer. I remember when um, I'd signed and so Soji was still in the background and I had a couple of games where I think in the games I had a couple of like 10, 15 minute spells where I'd make a few mistakes and what have you. And he pulled me in and he just said, what's he? Come on, you're better than this. He said, you know, I, I says, but he says, by now another manager might drop you. He goes, but I'm not going to do that. You're miles better than that. Just suck your head out, blah, blah, blah. Had that chat with me. And honestly, and that was the season that I went and played 51 games. And I really, you know, uh, flourished on that. And I was so sad uh, when he went. I got a text. I think it was the day before we went back training. I got a text from Macca. And I was like shell-shocked. I was like, oh, my God. And it really sort of knocked me duck up, to be honest, because... The end of that season, I don't know if you remember, he used to get you into his room individually. And, he'd, you know, one of the young lads would probably clip around the ear and give him a bollock, you know, whatever. Mm. But he just went, well, see, nothing to say to you, mate. You've been absolutely brilliant. Bring the same back next year. And I was like, oh, cheers, Gaffer. No worries. See you, you know, see you after the summer. And, you know, you're bounding out of the office thinking, oh, brilliant. Can't wait for next season. And then, and then lo and behold, he's gone. But I don't know if you remember, there was a few years ago when I was managing quite low down a non-league team called Renniff. And I messaged you and I said, have you got Lenny's number? Um, because I want to get, it was at Knott's Forest and I want to get uh, a pre-season game against the under-21s or something. And you were like, yeah, and it turns out I'd still got it in my phone. I don't know how, but I've got this number in my phone. So I ring him. I'm like, hey, Lenny, all right, it's Julian Watts. He's like, hey, mate, yeah, who's that? I was like, it's Julian <laughs> Watts. <laughs> you know, I just remember, what's he? Like that, he's going, who? And I'm going, what's he? Uh, I, do you, do you remember, I played I played with you at, uh, for you at Luton, Lenny, and he's like, did you? And I'm like, I don't, he got it, mate, it went from like a bit of a chuckle to the most awkward phone conversation I have ever had in my entire life. And I'm going, yeah, yeah, Lenny, I played for you that season, you know, I came on loan, I came on loan and you signed me and Sodji was there and oh, I don't remember that. And I was, yeah, because I played in the middle, babe, I'm going, I played in the middle, we had a back three, I played, and I'm having to explain the team to him. And I'm no going, way. I've got, I've got Marv on the left, I says there was Alan White and then Dozer on the right and all that. And he went, that was Steve Davis. And I'm like, going, <laughs> by this time, and I'm so glad I was sat on my own. I was in a Morrison's car park in Sheffield, absolutely just cringing, thinking, just get this phone call over with. And he ended up saying, anyway, never mind, what do you want? And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Oh I no! And I, so I've gone from this player who we thought did really well for him, and then actually can't even remember me. So. Oh my god! Oh, it was terrible, mate. It was terrible. I, honestly, if, if anyone would have witnessed that, honestly, I'd have been in a monastery now. I'd have just disappeared off the planet. Jeez. That's cringy, mate. 
so cringy. My gosh, it is. I mean, it's, 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 it's weird because obviously it, we've had him on here, like, and that if, if that if we, if you would have come on first, I would have been <laughs> ripping him to shreds. I would have been absolutely, I would have been going, okay, who's who's in there back then? And then he goes, blah blah blah, what not Julian Watts? No, we're not, not Julian Watts. <laughs> I would have been ripping him. Oh my god! I'm glad he was. Well, yeah. I'm glad he was in with me. Yeah, and, and despite that, he still he would still be my manager. Yeah, of all the managers I had, you know, I had Trevor Francis. Didn't really think much of him at, at uh, Wednesday. Play school teacher, and you know, again, he was offering me that contract, and he was talk. What's concentrate? And I'm like, oh, this is on the middle of the training ground. I'm like, oh, god. <laughs> Uh, but, you know, I did actually play some games for him. You know, say Martin, great manager. Not really for me, though, personally. Uh, I had John Ward, who got sacked at Bristol. Benny Lenartz, who came in, who was... I know I played one game and then outed me totally. So then there was Lenny, you know. So, I mean, like, it's not a great bunch, in my opinion, to pick through. But, but you know, I mean, again, and, uh, you know, I've, I've said it two or three times now. That season for me, and that, again, was part of the makeup of that season. I had the best manager I had. Had some great teammates, and we did, you know, some great things in probably, you know, a bit of adversity. So uh, that's why there's the good memories of it. No, uh, listen, excellent. So just before you go, last final question. I know you're not, you wanted to get out and get a little beer inside, yeah. Um, <laughs> listen, so just for the like listeners and the the clubs, Sheffield Wednesdays, the Rotherhams, the Leicester, the Bristol's, and Luton. What are you What are you doing now? What are you at now? And what have you been doing since you've retired? Oh, God. I mean, I've had more jobs than clubs, which is saying a lot, including all my loan moves. But right now, uh, I'm an operations manager at a retail food company we cater for. It's like a buy now, pay later. It was a supermarket doing basic food and, and stuff like that. But we're now moving out into it's become a bit of a sort of superstore, especially with Christmas. We're doing a lot of social. So it's an online operation. And I mainly, you know, run the warehouse, do a lot of uh, bringing in new suppliers. And you know me, I'll talk to anyone. So I, I, I sort of chat chat to the suppliers, bring them on board, do all the contracts and all that kind of thing. So uh, it's a guy that I'm sort of half related to or related to through uh, the, the missus and her side of the family. And I've worked for him before for a long time at a different company that was a similar setup and uh, we get on great. And it, it's just, it's a really tiny startup business. So there's a handful of people in the warehouse. I've got like three people in customer service, then there's myself and that's it. So it's quite a small company, but it's growing really, really well at the moment. So uh, yeah, yeah, quite. It's a it's a decent place to be in with you know again with the company I've got around me. Okay, no no uh, management, no, non league football. Like just he was doing a bit of that, wasn't you? A little bit. Why are you was. laughing? <laughs> Why have I hit a bad spot? It's, it's, it's a funny one because I mean, in my in my opinion, which is obviously biased, but it was very low down. So it's like if Premier League's League One, it was like step ten. And I, I felt, Marv, I had teams, if you come and watch, I had teams playing some football that not teams in that league don't play, you know. You, apparently, you can't play football like that in, in that league, but there was always someone with a bigger budget who paid, you know, a ten or more a week, and, you know, it was always hard work, your best players always left you, but I felt like I've had, I've had some down times, to be quite honest, but I've had some really great times with it. Uh, <laughs> I got I got let by, go by a club, uh, it was Renif, actually, in the first season I was there, they were, Never seen football played like this. We were winning 6 0, we were winning 7 1. And then the next season, it just all went a bit unsteady and we, we avoided relegation. So at the end of the season, they said, uh, Yeah, um, we think we'd like to, you know, part company. We've got another manager in. And uh, what we'd like to say is that we, you know, we're, we're parting ways by mutual consent. And I thought, Well, they're obviously letting me go. So, yeah, no worries. We'll part by mutual consent. That's fine by me. So we <laughs> put on the website, um, yeah, we decided to part company with Julian after two years of after two years of disappointment at Renner by mutual consent. <laughs> what? <laughs> yeah, and mate, I'll openly I'll openly say the second season it was horrible, but it was one of them seasons where I felt like I was every week I was like motivating the lads, and we were in a lot of trouble. We could have got relegated right up until the last two games, and it was a really looking back a great experience in what you had to do every week. You had to turn up every week and motivate players who were right. in a bad time and all that and keep this group of players together. And I thought me and the assistant did that. And listen, when we scored the winner at this game, the lads went mental, came over to us, the atmosphere and all that. 
uh, and had persuaded all the players to stay and take pay cuts for the year after. And I'm only talking like 20s and 30 quids, like. Mm. Uh, and then that someone had rung them, rung the club and said they could do a better job than me. And, and that was that at Renfrew. And obviously, mate, despite, you know, I've got a football CV, but they're not interested in that. They're, on, they're interested in what you've done sort of non-league. And so every job I apply for, if someone's done a division A, I've just applied for one the other week and didn't even get an interview. And you just think, I, I class myself as retired, but not by choice. <laughs> Chief, what what is he? Yeah. The thing is now, he was a, this, okay, listen, this is the approach now. Don't don't apply for these jobs. I wouldn't apply for them. I would just no. turn up. Just turn up. Just like, go there and just turn up. I said, like, I've come, I've come for the job. What do you mean you come for the job? I've come for the job. That's that's it. Why don't you sit there in front of them? Look, I'm, yeah, look, no. well, there's a process. Listen, mate, I'm, here, I'm here now. You might as well speak. To me. <laughs> That's obviously, I think that'll work better than what I'm doing now, Marv, so I might as well take a punt. So, so you're basically saying, Marv, that the way you need to get a job in non-league is squatters' rights. So, <laughs> Listen. Again, possession is, whatever... Possession is not intent to the law. <laughs> Listen, what you, and, and, and just to... Just to, just to put the cherry on the top and just say to them, whoever you're going to hire, right, whatever he said you're going to pay him, right, I'll pay you. There you go. The job is yours. I'm going to take that on board, pal. Thank you. Listen, I want to thank you, um, Jeeve Watsi, for coming on and um, being our guest this week. I hope you've enjoyed it as much as we have. And Very enjoyable. Thank you. It's been yeah. fantastic. So on behalf of Andrew and myself, I want to thank you. No worries, man. I've enjoyed it. It's been great. Great catching up with you as well, Paul. Awesome. Thank you very much. And that was Julian Watts' My Bet 11. <laughs> <laughs>